Using TMS Extend to add or remove volumes or DSNBs to your TMC. This is the second video of a two part. First video was how to prepare for running TMS Extend. In this video, we will actually execute the TMS Extend. Allocate the new TMC. Reminder to run TMS pointers or TMS APEC. Stop batch utilities, the DBS and APEC subtasks, the CA Vantage script. Run the TMS copy. Run TMS extend with the Parm of test. Review the messages. And then run TMS extend live. Run TMS copy afterwards. Restart your stop utilities and scripts. And finally review messages and ensure that the new ranges were either added or removed, or DSNBs were added or removed. So let's get started. Allocate the new TMC. Use the following format. Basically, it's going to be whatever name your TMC is now, with a dot .n added at the end. This is the example of the JCL I used, a simple IEF BR14. The dataset name matches my TMC, and you can see I have a vol ref to the same volume. This will put the new TMC on the same volume as my existing TMC. That is not required. You could put it on a new volume if you don't have space. Perfectly fine. For my case, I use the same volume, so I had a vol ref back to the original TMC. The DCB attributes, of course, are 340. I use the recommended block size of 8840. And the space, if you remember in video 1, when we had run the TMS build VR, it had told us how much space we were going to need for the new TMC, and it was 312 cylinders. So I allocated 312 cylinders. The output from this IFBR14, of course, is a very simple IFBR14 with the new data set being created and cataloged on the same pack as my existing TMC. Can't get much easier. Next, a reminder to run TMS pointers or TMS APEC. If you have run either of these utilities within the last week because you run TMS pointers or TMS APEC on a weekly basis, as we recommend, this step is not even necessary. However, if you have not run TMS pointers or TMS APEC for months or worse, years, it is very, very good idea to run it before running TMS Extend. Stop batch utilities. That includes the DBS and APEC subtasks, the Vantage script. If you have Vantage running, stop the CA1 scripts. You should not be running any CA1 batch utilities. TMS copy. We have a check in TMS Extend to ensure that TMS copy must have been run within the past three hours. This check is not enforced when you run TMS Extend in test mode, but it will be enforced when you run the production or active TMS Extend. If you have not run TMS copy within the past three hours, TMS Extend will add in with a user 1022 reason code 66. This indicates that a current backup was not found. So it's required that you run TMS Copy Backup within the past three hours. Now it's time to run TMS Extend with the Parm of Test. And again, remember from the first video when we ran the TMS Build VR in a standalone fashion, we had some sysin control statements that we had tested and validated. 
we also had some CPU list control statements from the standalone TMS Aud EX that we had run. And we had validated those control statements also. So those control statements simply need to be copied into the TMS Extend. Now, on my test machine, because I don't have lots of tapes to play with, I just run a TMS copy with all of the dump DD statements DD dummied out. I would not recommend, of course, that you do this. You would want to run your regular production TMS copy. One thing I will note is in the TMS copy report, you take a note and see how many DSNB records you have, how many volume records you have, because that's going to change the next time you run this. So here you'll notice that we have 225,001 volume records and we have 910,000 DSNB records. So in this example, you can see that my TMS Extend, I had the same sysin statements that I had created and validated in video one when I had run TMS Build VR standalone. And the CPU list, again, comes from video one when we had run the TMS AUDIX in standalone fashion and had created the exclude statements. So I had simply brought those control statements over knowing that they were perfectly correct. And of course, you see the PARM of test because this is the test run. So when I submitted this test run, my job started. And you can see that the TMS Extend started. It notices or it makes a nice WTO that it's in test mode. Oh, but I've got a problem. I've got the open for output of my TMC. I can't allocate it. I'm waiting for the dynamic allocation. That indicates that something else has my TMC allocated. I forgot to stop the DBS subtask. So I issue the command F space CTS CA1R because that's the name of my CTS address space on this test machine. So I run, I do a F space CTS CA1R stop DBS. That stops the DBS subtask. Now, Notice the times. The message saying waiting for waiting on dynamic allocation occurred at 1716 46. 20 seconds later, at 171705, I issued the stop command. While the DBS subtask was shut down, processing within TMS Extend did not resume until 17.17.46. That's because when we cannot allocate the TMC, we're going to go into a one-minute wait and try again. And so, because I had shut down the DBS subtask within 20 seconds, it was still another 40 seconds until 17.17.46 that the TMS Extend address space woke up and did the allocation. At that point, we were able to allocate the TMC and processing continued. Now, the actual TMS Extend, you can see the messages that are issued. I've attached the subtasks, the TMS Build VR, which we had run standalone fashion in video one, and the attach of TMS RDX which we had run standalone in video one. They are now attached as subtasks rather than being run as separate standalone utilities. We come out with a WTO, a multi-line WTO that lists all of the CPUs that we're going to be touching and whether or not they're going to be included or excluded. So the exclude for CPU A and the exclude for CPU B that we had coded our process XE90 is actually included. I confirm that by replying C to confirm. And at that point, the TMS XT95R is issued. This is simply a status WTOR. 
that you may or may not reply S2 to obtain the status. Once TMS Extend has gotten far enough along and it starts copying the TMC, it actually tells you how much is going on. 5%, 10% finished, 20% finished, and it keeps running total. This TMS XT09i is also important. That tells you when it's safe to run the TMS R init, which remember we had tested as a started task in video one. And TMS XT09i says signal all CPUs to access the new TMC. That means it's now the right time to start TMS R init. In my case, no other systems share it, so I will just be running it on this machine by itself. The output from TMS R init is very simple. It recognizes that a new TMC initialization has started. It checks to see I've got my TMC allocated as not PSU. TMC initialization has been completed. That message at 1732 corresponds with when my TMS extend had finished all of its copying operation, was doing the check for TMS updates, no more TMC updates synchronized, and the updates to synchronize preparing to switch and at that point the TMS R init took off and did its actual switch to the new TMC. At that point the TMS extend finished cleaning up, cleared the extend status for all CPUs and ended with a return code zero as expected. So now I'm going to simply remove the parm equals test statement and resubmit and again run the TMS R init on all CPUs when requested to. So in my JCL I just take the same control statement. I'm adding the 75,000 volumes to the 800,000 volume range and I'm removing the 50,000 DSNBs just like we had calculated from video 1 but I no longer have a PARM statement on it at all. This will be my active run. When this job runs, you'll see that the TMS Extend is starting. There's no warning message about PARM of test. He does all of the renames, attaches the subtasks, just like he did with the PARM of test. Goes through the 10%, 5%, 10, 15% count. signals all the CPUs to update and to switch to the new TMC. When I switch to the new TMC here, because this is the active one, you'll see the IF TMS9 TMC backup required audit file utilization has exceeded its threshold. This is not a real exceeded the threshold. the audit file is not really full. We trick the system because we are CA1. We trick the CA1 control blocks into thinking that the audit file is full. This generates the IEF TMS9 message and helps to remind you to run another TMS copy after the TMS extend has finished. So at this point We've renamed the tmc.n to tmc, cleared the extend status for all CPUs, and extend has completed successfully. Ends with return code zero. And the output from the TMS R init, this time doesn't look any different than the TMS R init executed when the TMC was being done in test mode, when the TMS extend was running in test mode. Added, and whether or not the DSNBs were removed that you had requested. So my TMS bin queue is simply TMS bin queue, TMS report sysout, and a sysin of headers. The output from the TMS bin queue is a standard bin queue report. 
However, you can see here that the number of DSNBs allocated, which had been 910,000, has now been decreased to 860,000. So we removed 50,000 DSNBs because I was over allocated. And the volume range, I've still got my volume range 200,000 through 399,999, but by scrolling to the right, I can see that I also now have a range of 800,000 to 899,999. So I've increased my volume range by that additional 75,000 volume records by filling out the 800,000 range of DSNBs. And that's it. At this point, you've extended the TMC. It's been allocated possibly to a new volume, possibly on the same volume, and you've added 75,000 volume records and removed 50,000 DSNB records. This was all done while tape processing was still fully active without having to stop any tape processing, and everything was done simply and cleanly. Again, if you have any questions about how we got to this point, I would recommend you review the video one to see why we're adding 75,000 volumes and why we're removing 50,000 volumes. You can find that on YouTube, preparing to run a TMS Extend. And for any documentation questions, refer to docops.ca.com. Thank you for your attention.